Josh Stripes is a little bit wrong about Guild Wars. One, Guild Wars isn't an adventure game um, exactly. It's um, it's a PvP tactics game that's easy to learn, hard to master, with both casual and hardcore appeal. And this um, core philosophy, this core design, filters down into the PvE mode, which is essentially a casual MMO with no gear treadmill or patches, quote unquote, that periodically reset the end game. So it's a casual game because um, you don't need to grind and reach a certain DPS level or gear level or skill level or have a certain guild to experience all of the PvE content or almost all of it or to just to just to get to max level or finish finish the story of the game um, it also your character doesn't lose value over time so this is a big issue with typical MMOs is players want something new so what they do is they release these new campaigns, these new expansions, these new dungeons and they make it so your previous equipment that you worked a long time for is is kind of worthless now. Um, so this is something that Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2 specifically avoided. Um, I'm not sure what the state of Guild Wars 2 is right now, as I haven't played it for a long time. But um, they kept to like a, a fairly flat stats um, cap, basically. Um, so it is casual in that respect. Um, it's casual in the sense that a lot of the PB content is fairly easy especially in the modern game um, but when you've got um, a team of players that know what they're doing most of the content especially at low levels is not that difficult um, but when you get to end game it, it can be very difficult um, and um, even just even just regular missions regular story missions uh, let's say in Guild Wars, towards the end of Factions or in Nightfall, um, some of the later missions in Nightfall were very, very difficult for players that didn't really understand the game very well. They were basically like noobs, what you'd call like noobs. A lot of these players tended to pick um, Dervish. Uh, assassins and warriors because those uh, those were cool right no one wanted to be like a, a mesmer <laughs> like like an act, an actor or, or a monk that just sort kind of like heals people or soaks up the damage fixes um, problems um, a lot of the players were like <laughs> basically Role playing as Naruto assassins and things like that. So the game has a strong focus on horizontal progression, exploration and a more direct form of storytelling than is common in typical MMOs. So if you think about World of Warcraft, the lore of the game is quite... It's... you have to go out and find the, the, um, the information, you have to piece it together um, by all these small references and experience playing with... like the... if you go into some of the, the early dungeons it doesn't really 
teach you about the overarching story and the most important things of the world and how it functions you can pick up a lot of that from the earlier Warcraft series um, but um, so Guild Wars didn't have any predecessor so everything is explained within the game and it's done very directly in sort of a bit like Final Fantasy you have a linear story you go from one quest to the next one mission to the next and um, the most important things that are happening in the world revolve around your character but they your character isn't sort of like a overpowered cliche like godlike being they are as as Josh sort of explained quite well they are just a regular adventurer um, that works together with a team of other players uh, and sort of is has a sort of luck lucky aspect in what they're able to do and just by hard work and putting the effort into it and a bit of luck they become the most um, important sort of, um, aspect of the story as as in trying to change the, the world and solve these problems and figure out what's going on um, it's kind of done in a way that you can sort of um, imagine that there are other player characters involved in the story perhaps like you, it's written in such a way that you could imagine that there was like uh, three of you three characters similar to yours going along in a team a bit like uh, Dragon Age Origins or something like that right um, the game has a lot of similarities to Baldur's Gate 2 Dragon Age Origins in this combat so it's a more casual version of that where it strips out all of the frustrating aspects which hinder the replayability like your inventory management your doing quests getting items reading quests so for example in Baldur's Gate 2 you've got like a certain order that you have to do things you've got to do like there's non-combat quests like um, murder in the bridge district where you have to like solve a mystery you have to just keep walking around looking random places talking to NPCs going into buildings like there's there's um, not much of that in Guild Wars 1 it's very much just um, find a quest because of the the markers on their heads if it's a side quest or it's usually obvious where your next primary quest is um, but you will go from one to the next um, you just follow it on your map marker so it's not like older games like EverQuest where you had to figure out everything by yourself it, it it's quite streamlined and it shows you where to go but it's not so streamlined that it feels like um, Fable 2 where it like literally has like a glowing trail that tells you or, you know there's some difficulty in in figuring out what you've got to do because the other thing is you've got a plan there's a lot of planning involved in Guild Wars like how can I get to this location the fastest way what um, what sort of team do I need to be able to survive this area how much um, how much of each skill do I need hench can I do it with henchmen do I need help of other players um, obviously the, the order that you do the quests in how to get how to even get to certain areas um, 
can be quite confusing. So to, with the horizontal progression and sort of casual drop in and do what kind of do whatever you want really it's um it's a lot like skyrim in that sense so um another thing is josh mentioned that the heroes the henchmen are designed for when the player count drops that's that is true but it's not it's not entirely true um, because the henchmen are there to reinforce the idea that this is a team game. Um, the game doesn't exist unless you have a team, if, essentially. The enemies are designed to work as a team um, compared to the average MMO where you have like two or three dumb sort of enemies that barely have any ai they barely have any skills um they just do like auto attacks um in guild wars the enemies are more like um boulders gate 2 especially with like the um, some of the ai mods and stuff like scs installed um so you you can't um you can't beat the game solo. You can't level up solo. You have to have a team. And um, in the old days, like people didn't really like to use henchmen because they weren't very good. With with game updates, they've made them a bit better, especially in certain places like factions, Eye of the North. The henchmen have better skills and their AI is better. But in the old days, they were just the game was harder and henchmen just didn't cut it in a lot of situations like story missions you could do it but you have to be really careful and good at the game um so it was better to play with players but players wouldn't want to there may be things you might want to do that other players might not want to do like let's go out into this map and see what's over there or let's go open chest boxes or something or let's just grind these enemies and see what happens see what see if they give you anything cool um just just lots of um things like i want to try and run over to this part of the map without fighting many enemies um, I want to try and get to parts of the map where I shouldn't be able to get to yet, or I, I want to just skip all the story missions. Uh, I want to go and capture this elite skill. Um, all sorts of things, really. Um, and the henchmen, and especially the heroes, really facilitate you having that sort of freedom. Um, so the weapons in Guild Wars 1 are very t strongly tied to the game's lore. So if you look like a game like Terror, right, you've got like mounts that are literally like cars. You've got like weapons that you like loot box for, like weapon skins. That you... And a lot of the weapons are just just random things that don't seem very... They aren't tied into the law in any way, or it feels like that. Um, so you've got like avatar weapons or whatever, and then with Guild Wars, the um, the weapons have a very strong sort of traditional fantasy European, like Lord of the Rings kind of feel to it. Um, it's kind of a realism to it, and the weapons you pick up tend to be out of a certain set of weapons that's um, sort of unique to that area. Um, so in Prophecies, you've got like winged blades, falchions, um, flat, flat bows, storm bows, long bows, um, 
short bows, um, horn bows. In in factions, you've got um, like crenellated swords, oni daggers, um, all of these just really weird weapons that are very Asian, like ceremonial daggers, all this sort of stuff. Um, and um, the stats, as long as the weapon has what we call maximum stats, which most weapons you pick up at level 20 will do, um, the weapon is like perfectly usable. So it's a lot of what you're looking for is the, the skin is very important and it's how it how it looks and how it looks ties into where you found it in the game um, and some of the skills have ties into quests and things like this like NPCs like there's a quest called the villainy of villainry of Galrath right it's a very epic quest in Lion's Arch in um, Kryta right um, so there's a skill called um, Galrath's Slash, right? So there's this tie-in between the skills and the experience of playing the game. Um, there's another one called um, Verata, and a necromancer called Verata, and some of the skills are named after him. And I think this Verata is someone you can sort of encounter in the game or do quests related to. Um, so there's a lot of that in the game. And I personally think that's really cool. Um, the other thing is the green weapons are weapons that typically have like perfect stats. So they're like gold weapons. They're high value, they're, they have good stats, and but unlike gold weapons, you can't modify them, so you can't change what stats they have. So, say your sword gave you extra health, um, you could change it to extra energy if you found a sword that had that on it. You can dismantle that one, add it to this one. With green weapons, you can't do that. Um, but they typically have good, they have maxed um, stat attachments, so they're good quality, but they also have, like, lores, uh, uh, typically they have a unique skin, not always, but they have a lot of lore attached to them because they drop from particular bosses. So, for example, um, there's a staff called Crefet's Refuge. It's a protection staff. It has a unique skin. It has sort of two like hexagonal crystal balls, like a Ferrero Rocher shape at either end. And it's a protection staff and it gives like energy plus five and protection, uh, enchant enchantment plus 20% duration. So it's a good monk staff and it drops from sort of wyvern -y thing um, I can't remember yeah it's it's something in the desert it's surrounded by these little spider things and it's actually really hard to get or it was in prophecies it was very hard to farm this um, stuff because he's surrounded by like I don't know 15 enemies that are laying traps and they have necromancer skills that are really annoying like life stealing so they suck your life out and they also heal themselves at the same time so um, yeah so you've got these green weapons um, another way it sets itself apart is it's buy to play, not subscription. So World of Warcraft and other games around that followed it were heavily relying on subscriptions. Whereas Guild Wars was buy to play. It had no microtransactions initially. Um, and even now the microtransactions aren't really 
they don't give really give you much of an advantage in the game. It's the typical stuff like clothes, uh, character slots, change your character's appearance, and things like that. The only one that really gives you a big advantage, I guess, is the mercenary hero slots. So one thing you hear a lot about in MMOs is people skipping the quests, skipping the dialogue. Just they just want to level up, they want that XP. Um, in Guild Wars, people don't tend to people actually engage with the quest and the story, which is you know completely different to um, a lot of what happens. Um, they'll actually read the quests and they'll get uh, very involved with them and they tend to be very memorable the quests as well some of them they're not just generic like kill 10 kill 10 of this go collect these things there's like the, not really there's nothing like that, there's no quest like that in Guild Wars, from what I can remember. Like, kill 10 of this, pick this plant up or something. So, um, solo, solo fighting in this game is, unlike other MMOs, solo farming and solo playing is sort of considered to be like a, a cheat, not cheat, but like a, a, sort of like a hack, but not, you're not hacking, you're just, you're doing something you shouldn't really supposed, supposed to be able to do, and that makes it more cool. But a lot of the a lot of the efficient ways to farm and make money, especially early on, were like solo farming builds. So like a warrior could farm like the ice caves and get the icy dragon sword. They had to run they had to run a long way to get there. They had to survive with these ice imps throwing like maelstroms on them and stuff. Powerful element ice elementalist enemies and um, they could also farm I think warrior could farm a uh, troll cave as well near Dropness Forge um, trapping trap ranger was a popular way to farm we used to farm duo or three man trap rangers in underworld you could uh, get ectos that way so what you do is you sort of put down your tra all your traps and then you lure the enemies into it and they just explode as soon as they get onto the traps. If I had to try and describe the difference between a game like Terror um, and a game like Guild Wars 1 is um, when I played Terror, it felt like I was learning a procedure. Like I was learning to be a master chef and cook a certain um, dish in a specific way. And with enough practice, you get really good at it. But um, every few months, let's say that they rebalance your class entirely or whatever. You have, it's like learning to cook a different dish, right? Um, if you're a good chef you can learn it easier how to do it but um, whereas Guild Wars it's like it's more like you're learning about the game you're learning like the game knowledge you're not learning a procedure um, it's more like learning maths right it's like applicable to many situations and what you actually do with that knowledge is dependent on your creativity, um, intelligence, ability to think on the spot and 
adapt to what's happening and that sort of unpredictability and variability is built into Guild Wars um, like the people you play with are going to affect your experience of combat and what you need to do on your character whereas not so much in Guild Wars 2 or Terra you just do your role you just perform your role and that's it pretty much you don't really adapt too much you just perform your your process as best as you can um, so one thing about Guild Wars one is you can um, if you understand the game you can play any class without really having to learn it too much so it's not uncommon to see uh, players that are active playing every single class in the game which is like 10 different there's 10 different professions that's pretty much like unthinkable in games like WoW where you have a, like a main character you, you have a character that is you're recognised as and you put all your grinding effort there's not much grinding in Guild Wars in Guild Wars 1 and you can easily reach max level so you can in factions you can reach it people have done it in like a few hours with with help and stuff 